Hey, what's up traders? Welcome to my PineScript basics course. The material in this video is taken from my website over at pinescriptmastery.com. This is basically a stripped down version of my free PineScript basics course. The official version on my website goes into a lot more detail. It's more geared towards complete beginners who have never written a line of code in their life. So if that sounds like you, you might wanna go through the official material as there's a lot of presentations and information about programming in general, like how to get started, what programming is, all the technical jargon. I explain all of that stuff in the official course. I've stripped all of that out for this version because there's four or five hours of content in my official basics course on my website. And I wanted to keep this video as close to two hours or less as possible. I think it's gonna be a little bit over two hours, but it's gonna be worth going through because the material you are about to watch will teach you everything you need to know in order to get started with Pine Scripts and start writing your own scripts. I'm gonna teach you the core fundamentals of Pine, how to use some of the more common basic functions um, like drawing to the chart, getting user input, generating alerts, and referencing inbuilt indicators. So I hope you find the course material interesting. If you do, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the like button and all that YouTube stuff. And uh, I hope you enjoy it, I really do. I'm really passionate about trading and especially PineScript. And I hope that passion rubs off on you throughout this material. With all that said, I'll get my ugly mug out of your face and let you get started with the content. Uh, have fun, best of luck with your trading. And I'll speak with you in the lessons to come. Take care. Hi traders, in this video, I'm going to be showing you a basic overview and breakdown of the PineScript editor. So the PineScript editor is inbuilt directly into the TradingView platform and you can open it and use it directly through your browser. So here I am on the TradingView platform. To open up the Pine editor, we just click on this tab here. So if I click on that, that will bring up the Pine editor. So this is what the editor looks like when you first open it up with a blank script. There are a few things to go over here. First of all, you can open existing scripts by clicking on this button here. If I open that, um, you can open an existing script from your own script library. You can create a new default built-in script. So this will create a new script based on an inbuilt indicator. So if I scroll down to, let's find the, uh, let's go with a, just a moving average. If I click on that, this will create a new script with the source code for the inbuilt moving average indicator. And if we come up and open a new blank indicator script, that will open a new blank indicator um, template. And if we open a strategy, this is the template for a new blank strategy. Then we have our new blank library script, and this will create a new blank library. Now, don't worry, we'll go over what each of these different types are. There's really only three. We've got an indicator script, a strategy script, and a library script. We'll go over all of these throughout the course. Next up, we have save. So if I click save on this blank script, I can name this script. It doesn't matter what you name it, but I would recommend getting into a habit of some sort of consistent organized naming system. So for me, for example, I like to put 2021 or the current year, 2022, whatever the current year is in uh, square brackets in front of my script or something like that, um, just to organize my scripts. If I open up my scripts here, if I go open my script, you can see that I have a uh, significant amount of scripts here and a lot of them aren't organized, uh, but I have recently begun organizing them by uh, year and also by subject. So you can see I have a bunch of PSMC scripts here. This is a PineScript mastery course. This is from the previous version of this course uh, from version four of PineScript. From when PineScript was version four, it's now updated to version five. So I'm re-recording this entire course. So whenever I create a new script for this course, I will probably call it uh, P PSMC version five dash and then the name or something like this. That way, when I open up my scripts, I can just type in PSMC and I get a list of all my PSMC scripts. You don't need to do this, but this is just a good habit to get into early if you plan on writing a lot of scripts. So let me open up a blank indicator here and save it. And I'll call this PSMC V5 dash pine editor let me save that script and now we'll move on to add to chart so if i click on add to chart that will add the script to my chart and now we have our script here and then next we have publish script this will publish your script to the trading view library we'll go over this in more detail in a future lesson 
but this is where you can publish your script. You can give it a description uh, as detailed as you want it to be. Um, you have your privacy settings, so you could make it a public or private script. A private script means it's only visible to those with the link. A public script is visible to all uh, traders on the TradingView platform, but you can protect your source code so that only you can see it, but people can still use your script, or you can make it an invite only script so that only you can see the source code and you choose who can use it. This is particularly valuable or useful for creating premium scripts that you can charge traders money to use, such as my ultimate pullback indicator, which is a good example of using this invite only version of a public script. But let's cancel out of this publish script dialog and move on to this little button here. If we click on this, uh, we have a whole bunch of resources here. So we can make a copy of our current script that we have open. We can view the PineScript official documentation. We can view the PineScript official reference manual. This is the same thing, but as a pop-up. So if I click on this, uh, we have the reference manual pop up within our browser. This is really useful when you're learning PineScript. If there's something that doesn't quite make sense to you or something I haven't covered in the course material, you can search through um, this search box here for whatever that is. So for example, if we're looking at an RSI lesson and I don't um, cover something in enough detail and you wanna learn more, then you can just click on this ta.rsi at the top of this list and that will give you the reference manual for this function. And it will tell you in detail exactly how it works and how to use this function. But let's close out of that. Um, the next thing we have is our Pine Editor keyboard shortcuts. This is a useful thing to look over and try to memorize some of these key shortcuts. If I click on this drop down box under Pine Editor, we have a whole bunch of keyboard shortcuts for use in the Pine Editor. So for example, you can save your script by just pressing Control S, which is useful. And then we have a bunch of lesson resources here. So the Pine Coders and Codify are kind of tutorials and examples of how to use Pine. Um, they're kind of just written guides. Uh, one other thing to mention in regards to the Pine Editor keyboard shortcuts is that when you're writing out your code, pressing Control Space will list all of the available functions and inbuilt variables we have to work with. So for example, if I wanted to see what technical analysis functions we have, I can type TA dot, and then control space will list all of the functions we have that deal with technical analysis. So here we have the ATR, if I click on that, we now have the ATR. So if I put in a period length here, like TA dot ATR 14, if I wanted to plot this to my chart, I could just cut this, Control X and paste it into the plot function, save the script. And now we're plotting the ATR onto my chart. So this is the power of PineScript, just how easy it is to get certain information and plot it onto our chart. But that's something to keep in mind. The control space uh, feature of PineScript is extremely valuable. You'll be using that keyboard shortcut a lot in your coding. And I believe it's command space on a Mac. Next up, we have this little button here, which just renames your script. Um, then we have this favorite button. If you click on this, this will add your script to your favorites menu. So when you click on the indicators and strategies button, your favorite scripts will be at the top of the list up here. Mine are taking a while to load because my internet sucks, but yours should load a lot quicker than that, hopefully. And you can see here that these are all my favorited scripts. Some of them are other people's scripts and some of them are my scripts. Then we have the search button here. Um, this is useful for finding and replacing things in your script. So you won't be using this very often on smaller or simpler scripts, but on longer and complex scripts, this is a really useful tool, especially for refactoring or changing uh, parts of your code. If you click on this little button here, that will drop down the replace text box. And in here, we could write something like um, ATR. Let's replace ATR with RSI. To do that, you can click on this button, which will replace the first instance of this ATR. So the very first time this tool finds ATR in your script, it will replace it with RSI. If we click on the second button, it will replace all mentions of ATR with RSI. And if you want to add more filters to this find and replace, tool, you can click on this button here and we can match case, we can match the whole word, or you can use regular expressions, which is basically patterns in text. 
Uh, you don't need to worry about this unless you're an advanced programmer. Now, the final thing worth mentioning here is this button here. This is your revision or script version button. If I click on 1.0, that will load into the Pine Editor, the very first revision of the script we have loaded into this editor. So this will load the script before I made this change of plotting the ATR. So let me click on 1.0. And now we're back to our blank script. And if I wanna load the latest version of the script, I can click on 2.0 and that will load back the latest version. As far as I can tell, there is no limit to how many revisions. Every time you save your script and make a change to your script, there will be a new revision added to this list. So I have scripts with hundreds of revisions um, and I can drop back to any prior version of my script. This is particularly useful for debugging scripts. So let's say you're trying to add a new feature to a script and after several changes to your script, you realize you've broken something in the script and you can't work out what you did. Using this as a, as a sort of undo button can undo any changes you've made to your script and reload a previous version so it's basically like an inbuilt backup tool in the Pine Editor. Anyway, that's about all you need to know about the Pine Editor itself. In the next few lessons, we'll cover some practical um, coding examples. I'll see you there. Now, before we get into actually writing code, it's probably a good idea for me to go over some of the basic things you will need to know about the compiler for PineScript. So the compiler is what compiles our code, converts it into um, information that TradingView's servers can understand. So all of this English um, written code will turn into computer code that the computer can run and execute our commands. The PineScript compiler is responsible for doing that. So when I click save here, I'm just gonna delete this script after. So I'll just name this delete. My script just compiled. And I know it compiled because I didn't get any errors. If, however, we do something like this. Let me get rid of one of these parentheses here and save the script. Now we have a problem. We have a syntax error, this red line here. Now the wonderful thing about most programming languages and compilers is that they will usually tell you where the error happened. So we get the exact line that this error occurred on. It occurred on line six, this line here. So that makes it really easy for us to, you can even click on this. Um, it's a link that will take you to that line of code in your script. So if I click on that, it takes me straight there. Now, every error message will be different depending on what you messed up in your script. A lot of these error messages are quite cryptic. So end of line without line continuation, even I don't know what that really means. Um, it's kind of, it's amusing to me, uh, some of the error messages you get in some programming languages. Sometimes they're really helpful. Sometimes you're just like, wow, thanks. Compiler, that was really helpful. So now if I close this off and save my scripts, uh, we don't have any errors. The compiler compiled our code without any problems. Let's try getting rid of one of these uh, quotation marks, save the script. Now we get a different error, mismatched character. This character here means we uh, have a new line starting. So PineScript got to the end of this line and then a new line started, but it was expecting this quotation mark to close off this string of text. And so it threw an error on line five. So most of the problems in your script are gonna be pretty obvious and intuitive. When you see an error pop up, usually it means you didn't close something off, you missed a comma, you missed a bracket, something like that. And within just a few seconds of reading your code back, you should be able to spot the problem. Now, some errors will be a little more difficult to solve, but in PineScript, it's very rare that you run into an error that can't be solved very quickly because usually it's a result of a typo of some kind. And you don't even need to know what the error message means. You can just click on that line of code and see at a glance that you missed something relating to the syntax. I will cover errors in your code in much more detail in its own section of the course towards the end of the course. So if you run into any problems, uh, maybe jump ahead and check out that section. Uh, but the last thing I'm gonna show you here is what happens if we get rid of the compiler directive. If I get rid of that and save the script, now we're going to get all kinds of weird problems and errors with our code. The reason for that is that the compiler now doesn't know what version of PineScript we're using. So right now we are using the original version of PineScript, the versionless version of PineScript, the first iteration of this language. 
I have no idea what the syntax is for that language. I wasn't around when that was a thing. I started using PineScript when it was in version three. And so recently version five has released. So I've had to learn the new syntax of PineScript three times now. I started with version three. So I learned version three syntax, then it updated to version four and I learned version four syntax. Now we're on version five. The good news is it's not that much different to version four. Um, if I set the version to four, say the script, we'll still get the same error because in version four of PineScript, we don't use the indicator annotation function. We use the study annotation function to create an indicator. So now my script just compiled fine. And so it's very important that you keep this compiler directive in and that you get your syntax correct in your code. You don't need these comments if you don't want them there. Uh, this will compile just fine as well. The reason why we have this compiler directive that allows us to target older versions of PineScript is for backwards compatibility. So there are hundreds, if not thousands of scripts that have been written from the beginning of TradingView's existence that are still very useful, even though they were written in an old version of PineScript. And rather than force all of those coders to update their code to version five of PineScript, TradingView simply allow you to target old versions of PineScript so that you don't need to update your scripts for them to work. The only reason you would want to update your script to version five of PineScript is to take advantage of the new features of that version. So I have dozens of indicators written in version four. I'm not going to convert all of them into version five of PineScript, except for the ones that I use regularly. Now, one last thing I want to mention about the compiler is that it is not particularly picky about where you put some of your syntax. For example, if you have a plot function that has a lot of parameters, uh, which we'll cover in future lessons, you can separate them across multiple lines. Now there are some rules with this um, that take some getting used to, but let me just quickly demonstrate what I mean by this. So for example, we could put a space between our plot and our parentheses, save the script, and this will work just fine. No problems, no compiler errors. We can also split our parameters across multiple lines. So if I press enter here and I tab indent this line of code and I save the script, we'll get an error. In PineScript, if you want to indent your parameters across multiple lines, you need to put a space after your tab. So now if I save the script, this compiles just fine. So the purpose of being able to do this is maybe you have a bunch of parameters in your plot function that stretch way off your screen. You can separate these onto multiple lines to make it easier to read your code. So for example, if I put a comma here and then enter, I could say offset equals one, comma, uh, title equals plot close, comma, a line width equals two, comma, and let's set the color to color dot black. And then let's move this parentheses down one line. Now, if I save the script, this compiles just fine. So we'll cover this sort of thing in future lessons. I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that the compiler is quite flexible when it comes to your syntax, just so long as everything is in the right order and you respect some of the indentation rules, which we'll cover in future lessons as well. But anyway, I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that we can do this sort of thing in PineScript. The compiler will allow us to separate our code across multiple lines under certain circumstances, as long as we respect certain syntax rules. I'll leave it there because I don't want to overwhelm you guys with too much information before we actually cover what all of these parameters do. But now at least you know that when we get into future advanced lessons, that this sort of thing is possible if you need to separate your code across multiple lines. Anyway, that about sums it up for the compiler. I'm sure we will run into other issues that I haven't covered here that we'll address in future lessons, especially the error section of the course. So I'll wrap this up here and I'll see you in the next lesson. All right, traders, welcome back. I was thinking while recording this material about my early days as a programmer, and I thought this would be a fun lesson. In this lesson, we're just going to plot the text hello world onto our chart. Now, technically we're already doing that. You can see I've got an indicator here, indicator function with the title hello world, and that's drawing onto my chart. But we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to plot a shape onto our chart with the text hello world above it. But before we do that, I want to sort of reminisce on my early days as a programmer. I first discovered programming when I was in high school. 
I was playing a computer game called RuneScape. It was an online computer game. And in that game, you had to do a bunch of repetitive clicking tasks. It was like an old school game, kind of like Pokemon, where you had a little character that would run around the screen and you'd have to click on things to make him walk there or mine a rock or do some fishing or whatever. Now, I can't remember where I found out about this, but at some point I discovered that some people were writing scripts that were playing the game for them and performing some of the more repetitive tasks that weren't fun. So there were elements of the game that were a lot of fun and there were elements of the game that were extremely monotonous and boring. A lot like trading, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's kind of uh, why I got into coding and trading as well, is I wanted to automate some of the more boring tasks. And hopefully this course will help you do the same in your own trading. But anyway, back when I was a teenager, I was around 14 or 15, I discovered the world of coding in the context of a computer game. And so I was writing scripts to perform tasks in this computer game that I didn't want to do in real life because my time was limited. I had to be at school all day. I'd get home from school and only have a couple of hours to play. And I didn't have time to do everything I wanted to do. And so I wrote these scripts that would play the game while I was at school. And it would level up my character and do all these things. Technically, it was cheating. And I did get banned for it in the end. Luckily, in trading, automating your processes is completely legal. We're allowed to do that in trading. But anyway, back when I was learning to code, this was before the wealth of information on the internet. You couldn't just Google how to learn coding and be met with thousands of examples and guides. And I mean, YouTube was barely a thing when I first started learning to code. And there was not that much educational content on YouTube. So I had to learn all of my coding from books. I had to buy books, rent books uh, from the library. And it was a really monotonous job learning how to code. But I remember when I got my first hands on a coding book to learn Java. And one of the first lessons in that book showed me how to write the words, Hello World into the command prompt on Windows. And I still remember the feeling of getting that short sentence to appear on my screen. It was absolutely exhilarating to see my own work, my own hands telling the computer to output something. Nowadays, that's kind of normal. I mean, everyone has some experience in scripting or Excel or just generally telling computers to do something on your behalf. But back then it was pretty revolutionary to me. And so I hope that this course can inspire that kind of feeling in you as we go through it. I hope that you get excited about what is possible with coding, especially in PineScript. As you learn to translate your trading ideas into code, I hope you get excited over the possibilities because they truly are almost infinite, almost endless. There are some limitations you'll run into as you learn to code, but for the most part, most basic processes can be done in code and you can automate a significant part or semi-automate at least a significant part of your trading process, your analysis process, setup detection, indicator signals, all of that stuff. But anyway, for this lesson, let's just quickly write the words hello world onto our chart. To do that, I'm going to use the plot shape function now this plot shape function takes a Boolean series, meaning true or false. So I'm just gonna pass true in here. And in fact, that's all we need. If I save the script, we'll be having a cross drawn onto our chart. You can see all these crosses here drawing onto our chart. Um, let's first of all set overlay to true. So this is actually drawing onto price action. So let me save the script, remove that and add it back to my chart. Now let's add some text. To this shape. To do that, we can use the text argument or parameter. So text equals, and now let's write hello world. And when I save the script, we're going to be getting hello world drawn all over our chart on every bar here. So let me save the script. And <laughs> you can see it's pretty unreadable. We have way too many uh, shapes drawing onto our chart now. So let's change that really quickly. Let's just add on a Boolean condition here. Let's say bar state dot is last. So now this will only draw our shape on the last bar on our chart. So let me save the script. There we go. We are plotting the words, hello world, onto our chart. As simple as that, literally one line of code. We have our indicator function. You need this line of code in every script. Same with this, but if we get rid of this, 
and I save it. Technically three lines of code and we're drawing text onto our chart. That is incredible. It's amazing how far the world has come in technology. Back when I was learning how to code, it took over a dozen lines um, and a heck of a lot of time setting up the programming language, Java, the runtime environment, finding a word um, editor, a code editing, they, they call them integrated development environments. They weren't even really a thing back when I was learning how to code in Java, or at least they weren't available to everyone for free. And now in 2021, as I'm recording this, we can do all of this in our browser, right through the TradingView platform in a handful of lines of code. It's just, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's so exciting, the world we live in and what is possible for everyday people like you and me. So this is just the beginning of your journey as a coder and the beginning of your journey, taking your trading to the next level. So I hope you're as excited as I am to teach you this stuff and as excited as I was to learn this stuff in the beginning. Believe it or not, this right here is the basic building blocks for every script you're ever going to write in PineScript. And it really is this simple. You can obviously make this as complex as you want. You can change the shape we're drawing. You can change the color. You can change um, all kinds of things, the location of the shape, all, all sorts of things. But it's not difficult. It's not complex. All it is is learning new habits and new rules. Coding is still in English. This is all English words. But the rules in which we express the commands we want to give PineScript are important but they are very simple. So you will learn them throughout the course. Don't be afraid if this is the first time you've ever learned any coding. If you follow the lessons step by step, one after another, you will be able to write your own scripts by the end, especially if you take the whole mastery course. So strap in. We're going to cover some really exciting stuff in the lessons to come. I can't wait. Good luck with your trading and good luck with your coding. Speak soon. All right, traders. So in this lesson, I'm going to be breaking down how comments work in PineScript. So comments are basically a way of leaving notes in your code for yourself or for other traders or coders who read your script. So right here, I have a blank indicator script using the default template that TradingView have created. And you can see two comments at the top here. These are automatically added to all scripts that you create through the Pine editor. This top comment here is saying that our source code is subject to the terms of the Mozilla public license. And here's a link to that license if you wanna read uh, what this means. Here's the license here. And just really quickly while we're here, I figure we might as well go over this as I'm sure some of you are interested in what, what this means if you haven't seen it before. But basically this just limits your liability as a coder. So it just says the covered software, which is our scripts, is provided under this license on an as-is basis without warranty of any kind. The entire risk as to the quality and performance of the covered software is with you. And you being the script user or anyone who uses your script basically is using your script at their own risk. Most open source software will operate under a license like this. And then next up we have our copyright. So this is a copyright and then it will automatically insert your TradingView username here. Now both of these comments are not read by the PineScript compiler. What that means is when the engine that runs your script through the TradingView platform does its thing, it ignores these lines. It's like they don't exist. And this is all the um, compiler will see. In fact, it will really only see this. So these comments are really just for your eyes only. And the way you write them is with two forward slashes. You can put them anywhere. They don't need to be at the start of the line. They could be after the line. So I could say here, I declare my indicator. Um, here we could say plot the close. And you can even use them to comment out code. So let's say we want to get the RSI here, uh, 14 period RSI on the closing price. Let's say there's a problem with our code or there's something we want to test and we want to temporarily remove this code without deleting it. We can just add two comments in front of it. And now this code is ignored by the compiler. So that is the purpose of comments to leave notes to yourself. One other purpose, which we'll cover in future lessons is what's called annotation comments. So this right here is a annotation comment. It's a special comment that is not ignored by the compiler, but technically isn't code. 
You could think of this as kind of like metadata, if you're familiar with metadata. So this is just telling PyNScript that we want to work with version five of PyNScript. If we get rid of this and compile our script, we're now dealing with the original version of PyNScript, which had no version. And we're going to get all kinds of errors because of that, because the syntax of version five of PyNScript is very different to prior versions. And by syntax, I just mean the grammar of the language, the way we express our code is different in version five than any other version. If I bring back that annotation comment and save the script, now it compiles just fine. So that's the purpose of comments. We'll be using them a lot in our scripts. I highly encourage you to comment your scripts heavily. Um, it's always better to have too many comments than not enough comments. The reason for that is there will be times when you write a script and you'll come back to it weeks, maybe even months or years later and you might not remember why you did things a certain way or why your code was written the way it was. Having comments can help remind you why you did what you did and it can help other traders know what you're trying to do with your code as well. So if you're writing public open source scripts, I definitely encourage you to comment them. And it's just a good idea in general to get into a habit of commenting your code regularly and extensively so that you know what you're doing. And it's kind of like, um, if you remember in school, when you did math stuff, you always had to show your work. You needed to explain how you got to your answer. Comments are basically the same thing. Using comments can explain how you got to where you got to in terms of your solution in your code. If I open up a script I've been working on recently, which is my Zen library, you can see that this script has, I think, more comments in it than actual lines of code. In fact, it certainly does have more comments in it than actual lines of code. Now that's not a normal thing. You wouldn't normally see that in most scripts, but because this is a library and we'll get into libraries in future lessons, I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information, but each comment here explains what each block of code does in great detail. The reason for this is that this library is designed so that I could give it to a complete stranger who knows nothing about me, who knows nothing about how I like to code and they can work out exactly, exactly to a T what every single part of my code does. If I got rid of all of these comments, the code becomes significantly harder to read because there is no explanation on um, what is happening. If I get rid of all of these comments and we're just left with this, this is not useful to most traders. Most traders will see this and they'll just move on to a different script because no one has the time to reverse engineer and deconstruct exactly what this code does. But by having all these comments, suddenly this script is much, much easier to read for anyone who um, is unfamiliar with what the code does. So that's the purpose of comments. We'll be using them a lot throughout the course. So as I said before, it's a good idea to get into a habit of using them, but don't worry, you'll see lots of examples of how to use comments in your code in future lessons. So if this doesn't quite make sense to you, don't worry, it will by the end of the course. See you in the next lesson. All right, hey traders, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be covering the indicator annotation function. Now, annotation function could be also thought of as like a directive function. It's a special function that tells PyNScript important information about the general nature of your script. So this comment here, our at version equals five, is what's called a compiler directive. So this is directing the compiler to version five of PyNScript. It's telling PyNScript, the engine that runs PyNScript, to treat the code of this script by the rules of version five of PyNScript. The indicator annotation function does the exact same thing, except that it tells PyNScript to treat the code of this script as an indicator. The reason we need to use this is because there are a couple of different variations of um, script types. So we have strategy scripts. So if I call this strategy, that changes the rules of this script. If I say library, that changes the rules again. So we only have three to work with, indicator, strategy, and library, but each of those have different rules that govern your script. For this lesson, we're going to break down the indicator function, which is probably the uh, script type that you'll be working with the most, especially in the beginning of your PyNScript journey. So let's break down the parameters of this function. So by calling this an indicator function, that gives this script access to um, a different subset of inbuilt functions and commands 
to work with. So for example, let's try and use a strategy function here. Let's say strategy.close, um, and we need to pass an ID here. Let's just say close our buy trade. If I save this script, we'll get an error here that says you cannot use strategy functions in indicator scripts. Please replace indicator with strategy. So that's why we need to use these annotation functions. If I change this to strategy, suddenly the script is treated differently by the PineScript compiler. It has different functionality and features. But let's stick with indicator for this lesson and let's break down what we can do with this indicator function. So if I hover my mouse over indicator and hold down control or command on a Mac and click on this function, on the name of this function, we'll get the PineScript language reference manual popping up here. And this will tell us all of the various arguments we have to work with here. It will give us a description of each one. Um, I'm going to break down the most common ones here that you will most likely use in most of your scripts. So let's get rid of our title for a moment here and hover my mouse over this function name and we'll get a list of arguments. So the first one we have is title. So this is your long title. So let's say I want to call this my super fancy script. And if I save this and move this down a bit, you can see that my script name has changed there. And if I were to publish this script to the TradingView library, this is what it would be called on the TradingView library. This is its long title. This is its more descriptive title. But you can see that it takes up quite a lot of space on my chart. And if we had a lot of plots here, a lot of numbers plotting out here, um, having a long indicator title name uh, could be a problem. So let's say we want to abbreviate this to MSFS. To do that, we just add in a comma here. All of our arguments in any function are separated by commas. So to add another argument or parameter to this function, we need to put a comma there. And then I need to pass in short title. And then this is a string as well. So we open up with two quotations. And let's say we want to call this MSFS. Now, if I save the script, watch our title name here. It's now abbreviated to MSFS, but our official title is still my super fancy script. And if I were to publish this to the TradingView library, that is still what this script would be called. But when it's added to our chart, this is what it will say in the indicator box. So that's how our titles work. Next up, we have overlay. So by default, overlay is set to false. So if I save the script, um, having it set to false draws into its own box. You can see we're in our own oscillator box here, like the RSI or Stochastics, MACD, those sorts of indicators. They are drawn into their own indicator box. They're not drawn directly on the price action like a moving average would, for example. But if you want to draw over price action, say you're working with a moving average script, for example, you want overlay to be set to true. Overlay just means it overlays over your price action. So if we set this to true and save the script, first, nothing will happen because we've already added the script to our chart. So to update this particular parameter, we need to remove our script by clicking on this remove button here and then re-add it to our chart. So now when I click add to chart, overlay will be updated and it will be drawing over price action. So if I zoom in here, you can see that this script is just plotting the closing price. So it's connecting the closing price of all of these candles on my chart directly over price action. So that's what overlay does. Next up, we have format. So let's set overlay back to false and remove the script, save it, add it back to my chart. And let's say we want to plot volume instead of the closing price. So now let's save the script and it will update. Whoops. It will update and now it's plotting the volume of each bar onto my chart. Um, let me go out to the daily so that we get a higher number here. So notice this number down here is an exact number of the volume printed. Um, it's not that readable. We don't really need to know the exact quantity of shares traded on, on a stock or in the crypto market, how many of a particular crypto asset was traded. In this case, we're dealing with um, ticks, price ticks on the Forex market, uh, tick volume. We don't need to know the precise number. 
So if you are dealing, this is mostly useful for volume. This I don't really know of any other use cases where you'd want to do this, but this format parameter, you can see down there above the blue underline, format can be set to format dot, and if I press control space or command space on a Mac, you get a list of the various formatting options we have to work with here. I'm not going to go over all of these. You can play around with these in your own time to see what they do. It's not often you will need to change the format of your script anyway, but in today's example, we're dealing with volume right now. So let's click on volume and save the script. Now keep an eye on this number here. It's now changed to a smaller number with a K after it. So if I hover over the last bar of my chart, that says 6.037K. So roughly 6,000 volume on this latest bar. So that's the purpose of the format parameter in the indicator function. Next up we have precision. This is your decimal precision. So let me get rid of this format for now. And let me get rid of this really quickly and save the script to update it. Um, the precision argument changes your decimal precision of the uh, numbers that draw onto the chart in your script. So by default, the precision is going to be set to the decimal precision of your price. So right now we have five decimals here on Euro dollar. If we were to go to a different market like uh, Bitcoin, for example, now we have a two decimal precision. And you can see after the decimal place here, we have two digits. But if we wanted to override that to a higher precision or a lower precision, we can do that using the precision argument in this function. So let me set this to five and save the script. Now you can see five decimal places after the decimal place on this script. Now, in this particular case, we're just plotting the closing price, so that's not that useful, seeing five extra or three extra decimal places on this price value. But what if we were plotting other values, other indicator values where we wanted to see those extra decimal places, but we couldn't see them because of the number of decimals on our price. So for example, what about a relative volume indicator? Let's say we want to compare today's volume or this bar's volume to the average over the past 10 days. And we want to know that number to a three decimal precision instead of just two. That's where this argument comes into handy. You can change the precision, override the precision of your indicator plot values with this argument. We will be using this in future lessons, but for now, uh, we can move on. I'll show you practical examples of this uh, later on in the course. Next up, we have scale. So this is the axis, the scale axis you want to plot your values onto. So by default, your indicator is going to plot onto whatever price axis you have on your chart. So in this case, we have price plotting onto our right axis. But if you wanted this to plot onto our left axis, for example, you can use the scale argument here. So we can set scale to scale dot control space. Let's set it to left and save the script. And we need to remove the script to update this and add it back to our chart. Now you can see that our, our values here are being uh, plotted onto the left scale, not the right scale. So again, not often you will need to do this, but there is the option to if you need to. Let's get rid of that for now. Save the script remove it, add it back to our chart. So whenever you're dealing with a visual update like scale or overlay, you need to remove the script and re-add it back to your chart. So if you make a change to your script and it doesn't update, um, a general good rule of thumb is to try removing it, add it back on. That will force TradingView to update your script entirely. Now the next parameter we have to work with is max bars back. This is not something you will often use in your scripts. I've never used it in my scripts, to be honest but it's here if you need to use it. Now this tells the script how many bars back it can reference from whichever current bar it's calculating on. So if we're looking at the final bar on my chart and we set max bars back to 10, for example, and I save the script, whatever code is running on this last script, uh, this last bar on my chart, the script can only reference the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 bars. So only this price action here. Now, 
Personally, in my own coding, I've written dozens of scripts over the years. I've never used this feature. I've never used this max bars back. I've never had to. I've never had a reason to. But if you do run into a situation where you need to use this function, this feature, this is how you would do it. You can set your max bars back to 10. Just keep in mind that this is in reference to the current bars. So when your script is running over historical price action, each bar on your chart can look back 10 bars. And then this bar can look back 10 bars and then this one, etc. So that's how that argument works, but let's get rid of it for now since we would rarely use that. The final parameter I'm going to cover here that is commonly used is time frame. So time frame specifies what time frame your script can run on. So for example, let's drop down to the four hour chart and change this to D, short for daily, and save the script. Now my script is plotting the daily time frame closing price onto my chart instead of the four hour. So if I zoom in here, you can see that each time this updates, we get a new value down here. So on this bar here, a new day began and the previous day's closing price was 54690. And then on the bars in between, we get NA because these four hour bars are plotting in between the next day. And then on that next day's beginning, we get the previous day's closing price, which was 57487 and so on. So that's one way to hard code your script to only reference a particular time frame. I wouldn't recommend doing this. There are better ways to do this. Depending on the script, if you have a script that you only want to reference a particular time frame, you might want to hard code it this way. But if you have a script that you want to be able to use on multiple time frames, you're better off using user inputs to specify the time frame of your script. And we will cover that in future lessons. I don't want to overload you with too much information, so we'll leave this lesson here. If you want to see what these other parameters do, again, just hold control and click on this um, function name and you'll get a list of the arguments we have here with detailed descriptions on how they work. But anyway, that'll do it for this lesson. I'll see you in the next one. Hey traders, in this short lesson, I will introduce you to the concept of namespaces. So namespaces in PineScript are what we call the keywords that contain certain functions or variables. So that might sound a bit confusing, but when I show you a visual example, it should make perfect sense. There are several namespaces that we have access to in our PineScript code. Um, the first one I'm going to show you is the technical analysis namespace. So for example, let's say we want to get the RSI value. To do that, I can create a new variable called RSI, and we can assign this variable or initialize this variable using the equal sign. So RSI is set to, and then we need to reference the TA or technical analysis namespace. So if I write TA here, then a full stop, and then control space or command space on a Mac, we get a list of all of our technical analysis functions. So if I start writing RSI, here is our RSI function. And you can see here that it is underneath the TA or technical analysis namespace. So if I click on that, we pass in a price source, so close and 14 default period. There we go, we have an RSI value. And if I cut this plot down here and change the plot from the closing price to the RSI value we just retrieved, and I save the script, we're now plotting the RSI. So PineScript makes it really easy to access all of the most popular indicator tools that traders typically use, and you'll find all of your indicator functions under the TA namespace. So that's really it for namespaces. That's all you really need to know. You can also create your own libraries. Um, we'll cover that later on in the course, but when you create your own custom library, it behaves pretty much identically to these inbuilt uh, namespaces. So for example, if I type in import Zen and the art of trading, control space, here is one of my libraries I've created. If I import this as Zen, I can now reference my Zen library namespace, the same way we did uh, the technical analysis namespace. So for example, if I write here, Zen dot control space, or command space, 
we get a list of all of my custom functions. These are functions that I created, that I wrote in my own code in the Zen library script. And I published this to the TradingView platform. I can now reference all of these functions the same way we can reference the inbuilt functions that TradingView offers or PineScript offers. But as I said, we'll cover libraries in a future lesson because it is quite an advanced concept. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware of that feature. And so you can basically think of a namespace as a collection of functions or tools that you've written, either you've written or the TradingView PineScript developers have created. So before we end this lesson, um, we'll go over just a couple of other namespaces. Um, for example, if we're dealing with strings, so text, this is a string right here. Um, if I create a variable called my string and we just call this a string of text, I can now use the string namespace. So str is short for string. If I put in a dot and then control space or command space, we get a list of all of the different functions we can use relating to strings. So for example, um, if I set this to the text 10, and then I use the to, uh, to number function, and we pass in my string, if I cut that and paste that into our plot and save the script, we are now plotting the number 10 after using the string namespace to convert this text into a number. And there are a whole bunch of other namespaces. We have the strategy namespace when you're dealing with strategy scripts. So you have your trade commands and various variables that you can reference, such as your current account balance and things like that. Uh, we also have the request namespace, which we'll cover in future lessons. This is where you retrieve or request um, financial data about stocks. You can uh, reference Quandle, which is a third-party resource uh, that offers all sorts of things like um, sentiment, um, interest rate information, all kinds of stuff. We'll cover Quandle in a future lesson. And then we also have the security function here, which we use to reference other symbols and other timeframes. So you use the request.security function to request, for example, we're on euro dollar one hour chart here. Maybe I want to check what the daily high and low is and then plot that information over this one hour intraday time frame. To do that, we would use the request.security function. And so that is a quick crash course on PineScript's namespaces. And we'll be using these frequently in our scripts. So you'll get used to using these and you'll soon memorize them all very quickly. Anyway, that's it for this lesson. I will speak with you in the next one. All right, traders, welcome to the price series lesson. In this lesson, I'm going to be showing you how to reference candlestick price data. So your open, high, low, and close. This is obviously going to make up the backbone of most of your scripts. You're going to need to reference this data very frequently in your scripts since what is price analysis without referencing price? So it's quite simple to access this data. Obviously, the challenge comes with what you do with this data. First of all, let me get rid of precision one. That's from a previous lesson. So here I have a blank script. Let me save the script to show you. So we're just plotting the closing price onto our chart. So by default, this is the default template for any new script. Uh, we already have our closing data being referenced. And to reference the other price points on your chart is as simple as you might think. So let's say we want to get our candle open price. I'm going to declare a new variable here called candle open, and it's going to be set to the open price value. Next up, we'll get our high. So candle high is set to high. Then we can get our candle low is set to the low. And then candle close is set to the close. Now you don't normally need to do this. You can just directly reference open, high, low, and close in your script. But for today's example, I thought this might be a little more intuitive to see what's going on here. So now let's save the script and let's draw these values onto our chart. So I'm gonna use a comment here and say draw uh, candle data onto our chart. I'm gonna paste candle open in there, copy this, and I'll paste it four times. 
and I'll just paste in each variable here. And let's change the color of each plot because if I save the script now, we're going to get four blue lines drawing on our chart and we can't tell what's what. So let's set the color of the open to color.blue. And now I'm going to copy this line of code and paste it in. And let's change the color of each um, data value here. Let's change the high to red. We'll change the low to green. And let's change the close to purple and save the script. We should get four different colors plotting onto our chart here now. And each color corresponds to each candle price. So it's as simple as that to get our price data, which is what we're doing here. So now let's say we want to do something useful with this data. Let's say we want to get the um, current bar's size in points. So we want to subtract the high from the low. So now let's create a new section of code here and I'll say analyze price data. And for this, we're going to create a couple of variables. The first variable we create is going to be called candle size. And to calculate the candle size is really easy. All we need to do is subtract the low from the high. So high minus low will give us our candle size in points. And let's plot this onto our chart as well. So we'll call this candle size. We'll set this to color dot orange. And in fact, let's comment out all of our open, high, low, close, because we don't really need to see that data on our chart. Let's save the script. We should be getting an orange line drawing here now, which is showing the candle size in points or pips in this case. So right now, as I hover over the last bar on my chart here, our candle size is 6.9 pips. So as you can see, it's really easy to analyze price data. Obviously it gets more complex the more complex analysis you're doing, um, but it's really simple to access this data and to analyze it. Let's try something a little bit more complicated to demonstrate the historical operator. So let's say we wanna reference a historical bar on our chart. This will reference the current bar and this will run on every bar on our chart. So as I hover my mouse, um, let's hover over this bar here, which is quite large. If I hover my mouse over that, you can see down here, this number says 65.2 pips. So this script is running on each historical bar on our chart. And so every bar on our chart will reference its own open, high, low, and close. But what if we wanted to reference, let's say 10 bars back. So we wanna reference 10 bars um, in the past. Let's go back to our current bar. And let's say we wanna compare the current bar's candle size to the candle size of a bar 10 bars ago. To do that is really simple. Let's just create a new variable here called candle size 10. And we'll set that to the high of the bar 10 bars ago minus the low of the bar 10 bars ago. So to reference historical data, we use square brackets and then we pass in a number, an integer number, a whole number. And this whole number is your look back count. So this will get the candle size of the bar 10 bars ago. So let's compare these two values. To do that, we'll say candle size ratio, and we will divide our current candle size by the candle size 10 bars ago. And let's plot that onto our chart as well candle size ratio with a color of purple. So when I save the script, we'll be getting another line drawing onto our chart that is comparing the current bar size to the bar size 10 bars ago. Save the script. And there we go. So the current bar is 130% the size of the bar from 10 bars ago, or 1.3 times. And it's that simple. That's how we reference historical price data. Very easy. And this historical operator works on any series of data that we can reference in PineScript. So this applies to indicator values as well. Um, it applies to basically anything that has a series of data that we can reference. So for example, let's say we wanted to get the ATR value of the current bar. To do that, we could just create a new variable here called ATR is set to ta.atr 
and let's just pass in the default 14 length period. So this will get the current ATR value. And let's say we wanted to plot the ATR from 10 bars ago. We can do so just like that. So this plot function now will reference the ATR value from 10 bars ago. Save the script. And now our white number here is drawing the ATR of 10 bars ago. Really, really simple to reference historical data. And this applies to anything, as I said, we could reference the um, volume from 100 bars ago if we wanted to. Let's say 234 bars ago. Save the script. Now our white line is the volume from 234 bars ago. There is a limit to how far back you can look. So if I set this to 999999 and save the script, we'll get a error. You can see this little warning sign pops up here. If I click on that, it says too large, max total bars back. And then we have our large number here. The maximum is 300,000 bars, which is still quite a lot of bars. So let's set this back to, let's say 10, save the script. And there we go. So that's how you reference open, high, low, and closed data. That's how you reference historical data using the historical series operator. And this technique applies to any value, indicator values as well. So if we wanted to compare the ATR from 10 bars ago, the same way we did here, we could just say ATR 10, and then ATR ratio is ATR divided by ATR 10. This will work just fine the same way this did. Now, obviously this is a pretty useless example of how to use um, price series and indicator series in our scripts. But in future lessons, we'll be covering more complex, more practical demonstrations of analyzing price action using this information. And that brings me to the end of this lesson. I'll see you in the next one. In this lesson, we're going to be covering the fundamental commonly used data types that you will be using in most of your scripts to perform your calculations and analysis. The first data type you're going to be working with in all of your scripts for the most part will be number types. So there are two types of numbers in PineScript. We have integer type. This is whole numbers. So for example, one would be a integer. Uh, this could be one, 10, 100, 20, whatever. Just as long as it's a whole number and there is no decimal in it, that will be called an integer. Next up, we have float type. This is like an integer, except it has a decimal place after it. So any number with a decimal place is considered a float. The reason this is called a float type is because there is no fixed number of digits before and after the decimal place. So the decimal place can float around. And so that's why they call it a float. Programming can be weird like that. Don't ask me why that became a thing, but you'll get used to it. So there's a lot of technical jargon you'll need to learn in coding. Integers just mean whole numbers. There is more nuance to this. For example, there is a maximum number that an integer can be, but you don't need to know about that because it's extremely unlikely you're going to run into that issue in PineScript. I certainly never have in the three plus years I've been working on all kinds of scripts. But anyway, moving on, we have our floating point numbers, float type numbers. Um, for example, a closing price is a float because there's a decimal number in it. You can see here on Bitcoin, we have two digits after the decimal place. That means that this price here is a floating point data type. Next up, we have, it's not a, another data type, it's just a different way of using floating points. So float type E, we'll call this. And if I were to say 0.1, and then use the mathematical operator E and then put two on the end here. What this is saying is return the number or the result of this equation, which is 0.1 times 10 to the power of two. Now it's not often you'll need to use this if ever, but the option is there if you need to, or if you're mathematically inclined. For me personally, I'm terrible at math, uh, which is interesting considering I became a trader and programmer. Um, but that's the beauty of modern programming. You don't need to be good at math to be a programmer. But if you are talented at math, this is a tool at your disposal. The next data type we have to work with is what's called Boolean values. 
So a Boolean data type is simply yes or no, true or false, one or zero. In PineScript, it's uh, represented by the word true and the word false. So a bool type or Boolean type would look something like this. True for true, false for false. So let me leave that as true. This is quite simple to understand. You'll use this data type quite a lot in your scripts. In fact, these first three data types will make up the majority of your scripts in terms of how you calculate stuff. The next data type we have that will be commonly used is color types. So color types in PineScript are their own data type. And to reference color data types, you can use the inbuilt um, data types that PineScript provide. If I type out color and then a full stop and hit control space or command space on a Mac and I scroll down, you can see a list of inbuilt colors here. So if I say color.red, that will give the PineScript inbuilt red color as a data type. And this can be passed into any of my drawing tools. So for example, we've got a plot here that is plotting our float type E. If I change this to say color equals color type, whoops, and I save the script, our line will turn red. So you can see there. So that's what color data types are like. You can also use um, hexadecimal colors. So if I wanted to um, color this red in hexadecimal, that would look like FF0000. If I save that, we get bright red. We'll cover hexadecimal colors in uh, a future lesson. You don't need to know them in order to, to use colors in your script. But if you are familiar with hexadecimals from web development, primarily these are used in web development. So if you're familiar with working on websites, you'll know how hexadecimal colors work, or you can use a hexadecimal color picker just look up hex color picker on Google, and this can be an easy way to um, fill out custom colors in your scripts. One other option we have to work with in PineScript is the color.rgb function. This we can pass in three values, or four values actually, red, green, blue, and transparency. So for example, if I wanted full red, I could type in 255, comma, zero green, zero blue, and zero transparency. Now the transparency is optional. If I just put in RGB as 25500, save the script, this will stay red. Actually, let's change this color so that we can actually see the difference. So this will now be bright green. There we go, because we've set green to full. So RGB colors range from zero to 255, zero being none and 255 being the maximum. And if we wanted to change the transparency, let's say we wanted to make the line completely transparent. We could set transparency to 100%, save the script, and now the line will disappear from our chart, but it's still plotting up here. So that's a, one way of plotting values onto your chart without the user seeing the actual line being drawn. I use this quite a lot in my scripts to draw information onto the chart that I want to reference in my indicator values, but that I don't want to see on the actual chart, such as stop loss sizes and things like that. Don't worry if this was a bit confusing. We'll cover color types in future lessons in great detail and in more practical examples. The next data type we have to work with that you will commonly use in your scripts, not all scripts, but some scripts will be the uh, string data type. So this will be string type equals um, text. So string is just what programmers call text. And in order to define it, we need to put two quotation marks on either side of our text. The reason why we do that is if we just say text here, then PineScript doesn't know the difference between this and an actual function or variable in our script. If I save the script, we'll get an error here. It'll say undeclared identifier text. If we put quotation marks around it and save the script, will get no error because now PineScript knows that this is text. Now you can use quotation marks or you can use um, single quotation marks as well. That will work just the same. If I save the script, this is treated exactly the same as if we'd used quotation marks. So it's really just a matter of preference which one you use. I prefer to use the double quotes personally just because I'm used to that from other programming languages. But if you're experienced in a different language and you're used to using single quotes, uh, you can use them in your scripts if you want to. And just as a side note while we're here, if you want to include a single quote in your text, 
you can't just add another single quote because now that's treating this as a string and then we just have a single quote on its own. If I save the script, we'll get an error because we didn't close off this string here. If we add a backslash in front of this text, PineScript will now know that we want to include this quote within our string. Then this backslash is telling PineScript we want to include this single quote within our text. So for example, let's change this to ITS bullish. Now, if we were to draw this onto our chart using a label or any other text drawing function, a table or something like that, this text would display on our chart as this. So this quotation would be included in the text and the backslash would be removed. So that's the purpose of the backslash. You can also do things like um, backslash N and that would move bullish onto a new line. And so if we were to draw this onto our chart, it would look like this. It's bullish on a new line. There are several escape characters you can use in your strings. We won't cover that in today's lesson because it's outside the scope of this lesson. I'm just introducing you to these concepts. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information. And so let's just get rid of all this and go back to text. And we'll cover escape characters and stuff like that in future lessons. So before we wrap up this lesson, let's plot all of these types to our chart. And we'll just have a quick look at what they look like. So we have integer type, float type, float type E, and bool type. We can't plot a boolean directly onto our chart. So we can only plot these numbers at the moment directly onto our chart. So let me change this to color.white. And I'll change this to color.white as well. And we'll save the script. So now you can see that we're plotting our integer type as 20. It's just a whole number. And then our float type. Let me change my float type to 33.3 um, .3 and save the script. Now here's our float type 33.30. Now remember in a previous lesson, I talked about precision of your script. Because we have two decimal places after our market price, we have two decimal places on our indicator values. So even though I set this number to 33.3, .3, it displays as 33.30. If I didn't want that, I could change my precision to one, save the script. And now it's only plotting to one decimal place. And so here we're plotting our integer number as a whole number, our float, number and then our float type E number and in our integer plot we are passing in our color type. Now let's use our bool type here. Let's say if bool type is true then let's overwrite our color type to color dot red. So now when I save the script this color here this plot will turn to red because bool type is set to true. And we just said, if bool type is true, override color type with the color red. And to override something, we need to use the colon equals symbol. We can't just use equals because that's declaring a new variable. We want to override this variable with this new one. And don't worry, we'll cover this in future lessons. I'm just showing this to you before we wrap this lesson up, how bool types work. So now if I save the script, this color will turn red because bool type is true and we've overwritten our color with red. If I change this to false, the color will go back to green because bool type is no longer true. If I save the script, there we go. So that's it for this lesson. There are several data types here that we'll work with. These are the common data types. There are other data types too, like tables, labels, uh, drawing objects, things like that. But we'll cover those in future lessons once you become more familiar with the basics of PineScript. So don't worry if you are overwhelmed by any of this lesson. Throughout the course, we will be using all of these data types quite regularly in practical scenarios. And over time, you'll learn how they all work and how you can use them in your own scripts. So that'll do it for this lesson. I hope you're enjoying the course so far. And if you are, stick around because it's about to get a lot more interesting. Hi. Welcome back to another PineScript lesson. In this lesson, we are going to be covering how to appropriately uh, or correctly declare your variables in your scripts. So variables are used in all programming languages. We've already covered a few examples of them. In this lesson, we're just going to keep things simple and cover the basic fundamentals of variable declaration. In order to declare a variable, 
we need to basically give it a name. And then that name is like a key. So we have a key and a value. So in today's example, we're going to be counting candles in our chart. So I want to count how many green candles are on my chart. So I'm going to say green candle count is set to zero. So right here, we have declared a variable. We've declared a variable with the name or key, green candle count, and we've given it the value zero. Now, PineScript will automatically determine what data type your variable is based on what value you give it. So PineScript knows that zero without any decimal places is an integer value, a whole number value. So whatever we do with this variable will be treated as an integer value. If we were to add a decimal place like 0.1, suddenly this becomes a float. And now whatever we do to this variable needs to be um, governed by the rules of floating point numbers. And there are certain things you can and can't do with data types. So it's important that you understand how the data types work. The good news is you'll pick this up throughout the course. It's not particularly complex, but it is important that you understand how data types work. Now you can explicitly tell PineScript what type of variable you want. For example, if you wanted to tell PineScript um, that this green candle count needs to be a float, we can just add the word float in front of it and save the script. And now PineScript knows that even though there's no decimal place after this whole number value, this essentially becomes 0.0. .0. PineScript is now treating this as a floating point number, even though we gave it an integer value. Now, if we were to change this to text, for example, a string, this won't work. If I save the script, uh, PineScript says declared type float is not compatible with the assigned type string. So whatever data type you give it, you need to make sure it's accurate. But the option to explicitly define what data type your variable is, is possible using these data type um, operators. So this can be useful in certain situations. For example, if I get rid of this and I set green candle count to NA or not a number, this is basically null, nothing. I've set green candle count to literally nothing. It's not a data type of any kind. If I then want to draw that onto my chart, so let me paste the green candle count into the plot, save the script. You can see that it says down here, line seven, value with NA type cannot be assigned to a variable that was defined without a type keyword. So we cannot declare green candle count as NA, but if we add float on the end and save the script, this will now compile and we are now plotting NA onto the chart. So that is one useful way of declaring a data type with nothing as its initial value. So we don't want this to be zero. Um, we want this to be nothing. The only way to do that is to explicitly give this variable a type keyword. But we don't usually need to do this, so I'm gonna get rid of that and set this back to zero and save my script. So now we're plotting just zero onto our chart on every bar. Now let's say that we want to count every green bar on our chart. To do that, we need to check if the closing price is greater than the opening price, then set green candle count to green candle count plus one. Now notice that I use the colon equals operator here and I didn't just set equals. Now, the reason for this is because once a variable is already declared, in order to overwrite the value that we've given this variable, we need to use the equals, the colon equals operator to reassign this variable to a new value. So for example, if I set this to 50 and I save the script, we will still be plotting zero here and we get an error or a warning. This orange writing down here is a warning, not an error. It's just bringing to our attention that maybe we made a mistake. It says here that shadowing variable green candle count exists in the parent scope. Did you want to use the assign operator instead of the initialize operator or equals? So when you're first declaring a variable, you need to use the equals. That initializes the variable. You can't use the assign variable until the variable already exists. So if I save the script now, we get an error that um, green candle count is an undeclared variable. So the equals sign is for declaring a new variable and the colon equals is for reassigning an existing variable a new value. So now if I change this to colon equals, instead of plotting zero onto our chart, 
like we do here, if I use the colon equals, we will now be plotting 50 because our green candle count is being overwritten with the number 50, but only on bullish bars. So let's say we want to count all the green bars on our chart. To do that, we need to set green candle count to green candle count plus one. So that will increment this variable by one. It will get whatever its current value is and add one to it. So let me save the script here. And you'll notice that on each bullish bar in our chart, we were only drawing one onto the chart. And on bearish bars, we draw zero. The reason for this is that our variables are re-declared on every new bar on our chart. So every time a new bar, historical or real time, begins drawing onto our chart, our script code is run all over again. It just keeps looping our code. So every time our script runs, green candle count is set to zero. And so it never gets past one because on every new bar, this code is run again, green candle count is reset back to zero, and then incremented by one on bullish bars. If we want this variable to not update on new bars, but to persist across all of the bars on our chart, we need to use the VAR operator. So VAR converts this green candle count variable into what is called a persistent variable. So this variable will now persist across all of the bars on our chart. And so whenever we detect a green bar, the green candle count will increment by one. Whenever we encounter a red or bearish bar, nothing will happen because our little if statement here will not be true. And don't worry, we'll cover if statements in more detail in future lessons. But for now, if I save this script, we will now be counting every green bar over historical price data. So if I save the script there, you can see that our line is incrementing slowly from bottom left to top right. If I reset my chart and hover over this last bar on my chart, we have 11,771 bullish bars on our chart from whenever our historical price action began. So that is the purpose of the VAR variable. Now the reason um, not all variables are VAR variables are because let's say we want to draw a shape whenever we detect a bullish bar. If I change draw shape to true and then we use the plot shape function and we pass in our draw shape variable, if I save the script now, you can see an X plotting in our box whenever a bar is bullish. So for every green bar here, we have an X. If I change this draw shape to a VAR variable and I click save, all of these bars will have an X above them because the very first time we detect a bullish bar, draw shape will be set to true and it will never reset back to false because we're using a VAR variable. So let me save the script here to show you what I mean. Here you can see we have all these X's. If I go back to the very first bar on my chart using the Alt-G shortcut, here you can see that the very first bar on our chart is bullish. And so draw shape is set to true and it is never set back to false because this is a persistent variable. And so we draw X's on every single bar. If I get rid of VAR and save the script, now draw shape is reset on every new bar on our chart. And we want that to happen in this case for this particular variable because we want it to be reset on every new bar. We want each new bar to be considered as a brand new calculation. So that is why not all variables are persistent with this VAR tag. And we need to explicitly tell PineScript when we want a variable to be saved across all of the bars on our chart. This VAR can be useful for all kinds of things such as saving your stop loss and target until one is hit and drawing that onto the chart. It can be useful for keeping track of certain market conditions. So for example, you, maybe you want to check when the RSI goes overbought. So you would set your VAR variable to true when the RSI goes overbought. And then you want to wait for a bearish candle. And once that happens, maybe you enter short, for example. And then maybe you reset your RSI flag or your RSI um, overbought monitoring variable. Those are some practical use cases for this variable type. But let's get rid of our draw shape variable here for a moment. 
And let's just count every single bar on our chart. To do that, we can rename our, our variable to total bars and get rid of our if statement and get rid of this and just plot total bars down here. Now, before we continue, I should probably quickly go over the naming conventions for variables. Um, the most important thing you need to know is that variables cannot start with a number. So if we change this to one total bars and save the script, we get an error down here because you cannot start a variable name with a number. You can have it after text. So we could say T1 total bars and save the script. That will work just fine. You can have um, any number on the end of your variable name and that will work just fine. You can have an underscore in front of your name, your variable name, that'll be okay. You can't use any other symbol. So we couldn't use a dollar sign, for example. Um, that will give us a compile error. So you can only use underscores and text to begin your variable name. And you can have numbers and underscores in your variable names. But that's as creative as you can get with your variable names. So that's important to keep in mind. But anyway, let's wrap this lesson up by counting how many bars in total have drawn onto our chart. To do that, all we need to do is increment our total bars by one whenever our script runs on a new bar. So let's save the script and see how many bars drew onto our chart. There you can see a diagonal line all the way from bottom left to top right. You can see that we've had 23,553 bars plotted onto our chart in total. You could also get this number by using the bar underscore index. So if I plot that onto our chart, you can see we get the same number minus one. The reason for that is that everything in programming starts from zero. And so the very first bar on our chart is considered bar index zero. And our script would have incremented our total bars to one. So in our script's case, let's plot total bars um, with a color of color dot purple and save the script. Now we'll get two lines drawing um, offset by one. So if I hover my mouse over this very first bar, you can see that our script says that this is bar number one, whereas bar index says it's bar number zero. The reason for that is that our total bars number is incremented on the first bar, whereas bar index is not. It's only incremented after that bar is finished drawing. So it starts from zero, one, two, three, so on, all the way to our final bar. And our total bars starts from one and counts all the way up to the last bar. So that about does it for our variable declaration rules and fundamentals. We'll be covering variable declaration in quite some detail in the lessons to come and in much more practical use cases. So again, if this is all brand new to you and you're a little bit overwhelmed, don't worry. Just keep going through this content and eventually it will start to click. You can always rewatch the lessons or send an email to support at theartoftrading.com if something doesn't make sense to you. And I can help guide you to understand these concepts better. But with that said, that brings me to the end of this lesson. I'll see you in the next one where we will cover getting user input in your scripts. See you there. Okay, so in the official PineScript Basics course over on my website at pinescriptmastery.com, this is where I would get into how to get user input from the settings menu in your scripts. Now, the problem I have here is that this video alone is 40 minutes long, almost, and would make this YouTube video three hours long. And I wanted to try and keep this at two hours or less. So instead of copying this lesson, from the official course into this YouTube series, I'm just going to briefly go over the basics of user input. So in the official lesson, um, I go into great detail about each input type and all of the parameters we have to work with when getting user input. But for this lesson, I'm going to keep things extremely simple. We're just going to get a couple of user inputs without bothering with all of these extra optional parameters. And if you do want to learn the specifics of all of the various advanced user input functionality and features we have to work with in Pine, then it's definitely going to be worth signing up to the official PineScript Basics course and going through the material. So let's jump into the Pine editor and go over some basic user input so that you can at least get started 
with adding options to your scripts. So here I am with a blank script. All I'm doing is plotting an A to the chart so that my script will compile. And let's get started with getting some user input. So the first type of input I wanna show you guys is a Boolean input. And to get a Boolean input, which is just a true or false value, we use the input.bool function. And this function has several parameters we can work with. I'm just gonna show you how to use the title and the default value. So I can title this um, some true false setting and set the default value to, let's set it to true. Save my code. And now I've opened up the little settings menu here. We have our some true false setting that we can turn on or off and we can reference this in our script like we would any other variable. The next two inputs I wanna show you are number inputs. So the first one is going to be an integer input. That's just a whole number. So input.int will get you a whole number input. Again, this has several parameters. We're only going to cover a couple of parameters here. The first one's going to be title. We'll set this to an integer input. We'll set the default value to 33 and we will set the minimum value to zero and the max val to 40. And let's also set the step to two. So now when I save my code, I'll explain what each parameter here does. If I open up the settings menu, we now have a number input. The step parameter tells the interface how many numbers to increment or decrement when we click the up and down arrows here. So if I click up, you can see it's going up in steps of two. And now that we've reached 39, we cannot go any higher because our maximum value is 40. And because this up arrow is trying to increment this to 41, it's not working. You'd have to type in manually 40 and that will work. If you type in anything higher, if we type in um, 50, it will do what I just did there. Just cut off the zero. Um, let's try something different. Let's try 77, uh, let's try 99. Yeah, you can see it's just cutting off the second number there and rounding down to the first number. Um, and same with our minimum val. If we go down to zero, um, because we're incrementing in steps of two, we're trying to go to minus one, but we can't here because we've set the minimum value to zero. If I set this to negative 10, save my code, open the settings. Now we can go down into the negative numbers. So that's how we get integer inputs from the user. Let's have a look at float inputs or decimal numbers. To do that, we just use the input.float, title this decimal input. We'll give it a default value of 11.1. .1. And uh, if I hover over this function name, you can see it has a bunch of other input function parameters. Now I won't bother with min val, max val, and step. I just showed you how to do that with integers. It's exactly the same with floats. Uh, but what I will show you how to do is use the confirm parameter. So if I set confirm to true, save my code. Uh, for this to work, I need to remove the script from my chart. And when I add the script to my chart, now that I've set confirm equals true on this input variable, watch what happens. When I click add to chart, I now have to confirm this input. So this confirm dialog popped up. Anything you set confirm equals true to will pop up when you first add the script to your chart. And now you need to set this to whatever this setting is supposed to be. Then you click apply. Now, when you open up the settings menu, everything is uh, back to normal. So that's a float input, very simple there, pretty much the same as an integer. Um, one slightly different input I'll show you how to use is the price input. So a price input is essentially a float input, except that it's treated as a price value. So if I set price input, uh, let's set the default value to zero and set confirm equals true. Watch what happens now when I click uh, save and add the script to my chart. Actually, let me get rid of this confirm equals true since I already showed you how that works. This one is slightly different. A price input is slightly different to a float input. And I'll show you what I mean. If I click add to chart, we now have to set the price input price for our uh, basic user input script. And you can see we have this um, horizontal line that tracks with my mouse. This is making me, forcing me to select a price value with my mouse. So for example, if you're writing a script, uh, maybe that detects uh, candlestick patterns around a support and resistance level and alerts you so that you don't need to babysit your charts all day. You could use this type of input to place this line at a support level. Like I see here, if I click right here and I open up my settings menu, my price input has now been set to the price value that I just clicked on. So that's a really cool feature in Pine. You can also do this with time inputs. So if I quickly show you a time input, input dot uh, time. And I forgot to mention, if you press control space after you write input, here is a list of all the input functions we have to work with. 
I'm not going to cover all of them because that's why the uh, other video is 40 minutes long in the main PineScript basics course on my website. But I will quickly show you how to use a time input the same way we just uh, used the price input. So let's just set the default value to zero and set confirm equals true. And watch what happens now if I get rid of the confirm equals true in our price input and I save my code and I remove the script and add it back to my chart. Now I have to select the time input for this variable. And we now have a vertical line tracking my mouse, uh, which is showing the time that I'm hovering over. This is perfect for something like an ATR trailing stop. There is a video on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you search my channel for ATR trailing stop, I did release a video lesson explaining how to create an ATR based trailing stop where you use this type of input to select where to begin trailing from. And once you select the bar, the script begins trailing below price action uh, until price comes down and hits it. So that's a really cool input there. Now, I think I'll wrap this lesson up here to keep it short. Hopefully you get the idea by now. Anyway, that will do it for this particular part of the basics lesson video here on YouTube. If you wanna go into more detail about some of these other parameters or some of the inputs I haven't covered here, make sure to go to pinescriptmastery.com and sign up for the basics course. It's completely free, but there is a lot more information there. There's at least a couple of hours of extra content. Anyway, with that said, I will see you in the next lesson coming up right about now. Hi traders, in this lesson, I'm gonna be showing you the fundamental concepts that you need to know regarding alerts in PineScript. So there are two ways to trigger alerts in PineScript. Both ways depend on Boolean triggers. So true or false triggers. If the trigger is true, an alert is fired. If it is false, no alert is triggered. So for today's example, we're gonna keep it extremely simple. Uh, we'll cover practical alerts for things like setup detection, indicator conditions, that sort of thing in future lessons. For now, I'm just going to give you an overview of the basic functionality of alerts. So to do that, we're going to create a really simple uh, alert condition. For this lesson, we're going to detect higher closes and lower closes. So HC is going to stand for higher close. And that's just going to check, does the current bar close higher than the previous bar's high? And then lower close is the same, but the opposite. Does the current bar close lower than the previous low? And this is the first time you're seeing the greater than and less than operators. In a future lesson, in the next section, we'll cover all of the different math operators and PineScript operators we have to work with. Uh, don't worry about that for now. Basically, today we're just dealing with two Boolean variables, high close, lower close. If the current bar closes higher than the previous high, high close is set to true. Otherwise, it's set to false and the same for lower close, but the opposite. It needs to close lower than the previous bar's low. And so now we have two different ways we can trigger alerts with these variables. The first way is to use the alert function. The second way is to use the alert condition function. And I'll go over the differences now. So first of all, let's use the alert function. The way this works is an alert function triggers an alert as soon as it is called. So for example, if we check if hc is equal to true, fire our alert. And this alert function takes two parameters, message, which is a string, and frequency, which is an inbuilt variable, or built-in variable. So we have three options here, once per bar, once per bar close, and both of these options basically. So if we set this to once per bar close, this alert will only fire if the current bar closes as a higher close bar. And the message can be anything. So we could make our string anything. I'm going to say here that uh, this bar closed higher than previous bar. And then I'm gonna add a colon on the end. And then I'm gonna add on the current closing price of the bar to our alert. So to do that, we need to use the to string function because you cannot add a number directly to a uh, string and we need to use the str namespace here we'll go over namespaces in a future lesson but we need to say str dot to string and then pass in our number and this will convert the current closing price into text into a string and so when we get a high close bar that closes so our alert frequency is set to once per bar close if we get a high close bar 
an alert will be fired with this text. So that's one way we can trigger alerts. It's quite simple, really. And now you don't need to specify these parameters here. The function will assume that the first parameter you give it is a string. So we could get rid of message equals. And we, it will also assume that the next parameter will be a alert frequency. So we can get rid of that. So we have our alert function triggering with a string argument and a frequency argument only on high close bars. Then we could do the same for if lower close. I could copy this string, paste it in there, change that to lower. And now we've got an alert firing on a lower close candle. And just to demonstrate that we can do it, let's change this to frequency once per bar. So this will not wait for the bar to be confirmed. It won't wait for the bar to close. So that's one way to fire alerts. And it's my preferred way to trigger alerts in my scripts. But there is also another option here, and that is the alert condition function. So this alert condition function cannot be placed in an if statement. It needs to be in your main script's scope. So it can't be in an if statement. It needs to be in your main script's sort of body of text. So it needs to be checked on every single bar on your chart. And this function takes three parameters instead of two. The first is the condition, the Boolean condition to trigger the function. So in this case, if we wanted to trigger an alert for high closes, we would pass in HC, comma. That's our condition. If HC is true, then the alert will fire. And then we have our title. So here I'm gonna say um, higher close alert. And then we have our message. So for this, I'm just going to say the same thing here. This bar closed higher than the previous bar. Let's save the script and make sure that compiles. And there we go, no problems there. Now how this will work is on our real-time bar, on the current bar on our chart, this alert condition function will check is HC true? If it is, then fire an alert with the title, higher close alert and the message, this bar closed higher than the previous bar. Now, there are a couple of differences between these functions. The first important one is that we cannot just add on our closing price as a string here the same way we can with this alert function. If I save this script now, we will get an error. Cannot call alert condition with argument message equals and then our series string. So a series string just means a string that can change based on certain conditions. So the closing price can obviously change at any time. The alert condition function does not accept any parameter that can change at any time. It needs a constant string, meaning a string that never changes, such as this right here. The only exception with this is that we can use placeholder tags. So if I come up to the alert button here and click on that, and I scroll down to the bottom here, you can see this text here. You can use special placeholders such as close, time, plot zero, etc. If you click on this little question mark button here, you can see all of the different placeholders we can use in our alerts. And there are quite a few of them. When we are using the alert condition function, the placeholder tags are the only way to put in variables that change. So for example, if we wanted to put in the closing price, we would need to do two curly brackets and then write close and then two close curly brackets. This placeholder would be replaced by trading view when the alert fires with the current closing price. So now if I save the script and we come up to the alert button and I select our script alerts, if I click on this little drop down box here, you'll see that we have our any alert function call as an option. That is this function here. So we could set up an alert so that either of these get fired or we can select our higher close alert, which is our alert condition. So if I click on that and I say once per bar and turn off my webhook. Uh, we'll cover webhooks in a future lesson. Don't worry about them for now. Um, but if I just set an alert as this is right now, I've set it to once per bar um, because the current bar's price is greater than the previous bar's high, this alert should fire immediately. So let me click create, we'll wait for price action to move. As soon as price action moves, there we go, our alert is fired. So you can see 
when I hover over that alert, it says this bar close higher than the previous bar and then it has the closing price. So our little placeholder here was replaced with the closing price. You could also put in the ticker if you wanted to. So now if I save the script and set a new alert and select high close alert and click create, now we have a new alert that fired and you can see that it now says the market, the ticker ID of the market that fired this alert. So that's how you pass in dynamic information into your alert condition functions. The alert function on the other hand is a lot easier to pass in information. So this particular function is definitely the preferred method for dealing with third party APIs. For example, for trade automation using TradingView alerts, you would be better off using this alert function if you can. This alert condition on the other hand is great for manual alerts because you can give each alert a title. So for example, I could copy this, paste it down here, change this to lower close and change the condition to our lower close variable. Change that to lower. So here's our lower close alert. And then let's say we wanna merge both of these. So we wanna say if we have a higher close or we have a lower close, then we have a HC LC alert. And then we could just say this bar close higher or lower than the previous bar. Now if I save the script and we come up to the alerts dialog and select our script. When I click on this drop down box, we have three different alerts to choose from here. We have a higher close, lower close alert, high close alert and lower close alert with their own titles. So this is really useful for setting manual alerts in your scripts. Say you have a script that is designed to help traders trade your script manually and you want to detect things like a certain candlestick patterns or certain indicator conditions, that sort of thing. This is a great way to separate your alerts with a title to make it more intuitive for the user. Whereas this any alert function call will literally fire for any alert function call that we put in our script. Now, if I were to create this alert, nothing would happen because I've set my alert frequency to once per bar close. So we would have to wait for the bar to close higher than the previous bar for this to fire. Let me get rid of this close um, out of our alert frequency. So this should now fire immediately as soon as I set an alert on this any alert function call. So let me first click show pop up and then click create. We'll see what happens. There we go. An alert just fired on euro dollar. It fired based on the any alert function call condition. And we get our text here that we wrote out here. So this bar closed higher than the previous bar. And then we have our bar price, our closing price. So for example, let's say we wanted to pass the current RSI value to our alert as well. We could replace um, this bar close higher than the previous bar and then set the RSI value in there. So now it will tell us the current RSI value when we set our alert. So let me select alerts, leave that as it is, click create. There we have it. Now you can see our RSI value. Now there's a lot of decimal places here. Um, I'll show you in a future lesson how you can truncate or cut excess decimal places off your alerts. Uh, but for now, that's not important. You can see the, the current RSI value over the 14 period is 68.62 or 63 if we round it up. And that's really all you need to know for alerts. We have these two methods for setting alerts. Both have their pros and cons. The pros for the alert function is that we can easily pass in values. So price values, indicator values, third party syntax for sending your alerts to a service that automates your trades based on your alerts. If you're using a service like that, they will require a certain syntax for your alerts. So for example, you might need to say, um, set my stop loss to, and then in here you could set to string your stop loss price. And then you might need to put in a comma, take profit equals, and then put in your um, take profit price, etc. And then you could send this information to a third party API using a webhook using this. So for example, I've been using Pine Connector recently to automate some of my trading strategy scripts. If I send the right syntax in an alert message to this URL using the TradingView alert functionality, Pine Connector will automatically manage my trades for me based on the commands I give it in my alert message. And I can pass in my stop loss price, 
break-even distance, trailing stops, um, limit order entry prices, all that sort of thing, just using this technique that you see right here. So that'll do it for this particular lesson on alerts. This is the basic core functionality of alerts. We'll cover more detailed practical applications of this information in future lessons, especially when we get into setup, detection, and indicator conditions, that sort of thing. So I hope you found this lesson interesting, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi traders, welcome back to another lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be breaking down the plot function, and I'll be demonstrating how you can use it to plot data onto your chart. So the plot function is used to plot numbers onto the chart and numbers only. We can't plot any other data type other than numbers using this particular function. So here we are just plotting the closing price onto our little indicator box here. If I change this to anything else, let's try and plot a Boolean, plot true. I'll save the script, we'll get an error. Cannot call plot with argument. Uh, an argument of bool type was used, but a series float type was expected. So we can only plot numbers. Let's try a string, text, save, error. Cannot call plot with argument, text. An argument of string was used, but float is expected. So we cannot plot any data type other than numbers using this function. To plot other data types, we need to use other types of functions. But the plot function is still extremely useful for plotting things, obviously, like indicator values and so on. And so for this particular lesson, I'm just going to plot the closing price. And I'm going to walk you through the uh, various parameters that this plot function takes that we can use to manipulate its output. So the first thing it takes is a series, and this could be anything. It could be a uh, price value, open, high, low, close. It could be an indicator value. It could just be a number that we want to plot. So here we can plot the number one across our chart. We can also title the function. So I'm going to call this our plot, save the script. And now if I open up the settings menu by clicking on this little cog icon, here on the style tab, you can see that our plot now has a title. If we don't title our plot, then it would just be called plot. So the purpose of titling your plots is to make it easy for your user, the users of your script to know what your plot does. And maybe they wanna turn it off or change its color or its style. The next parameter we have to work with with our plot function is the color parameter. So you can set the color to anything you want. By default, it's usually blue, um, but you can set this to any inbuilt color or custom color that you want. So for now, let's set it to purple. Save the script and we have a purple line. The next parameter this plot function takes is line width. So this ranges from one to five, I believe. So by default, it's one which is the thinnest line you can plot. If we set it to five, it becomes very thick, like so. One valuable use case for this line width function is when plotting things like a moving average. Maybe you want your longer term moving average to be thicker than your shorter term moving average. For example, I created a script here called multiple moving averages. If I add that to my chart and we zoom out, if I turn on all of the moving averages, you can see that they range from thin to very thick at the bottom here, based on the length of the lookback period for that moving average. So that's one useful practical use case for this line width parameter. The next parameter we have is style. So this is the style of the data that we're plotting. To change the style, you just type in plot dot and then control space. And any of these style built-in variables will dictate what your data looks like. So you could set it to circles, save the script. Now we're plotting um, actual circles onto the chart. You could set it to an area, for example. It's hard to see the peaks and valleys of this area because price action is so tight on this time frame. If we go out to the weekly, we can see a little bit more of that. We could also plot uh, columns if we wanted to. So if I set this to columns and save the script, now we're plotting price as a column. So this is obviously most useful for something like plotting volume. So if we change the plot to volume, now we're plotting volume as a column. But let's change this back to a simple line. And I'll change our plot back to the closing price as well. Now the next parameter we have to work with with our plot function is the track price parameter. 
So track price is a Boolean parameter, true or false. It's false by default, so it's turned off by default, but if you wanna turn it on, you just set this to true. And what this will do is just plot a horizontal line across our um, chart, like you see there, which is tracking the current price of our plot. So if I go down to a one minute time frame, you'll notice this line moving around as price action moves. And it's literally just tracking the price, the current price of this plot. The next parameter we can use in this function is the hist base parameter. So hist base is short for histogram base. And this is the base price of histograms, columns, and let me open up the plot documentation. So it says here that hist base is the price value used as the reference level when rendering plot with histograms, columns, or areas. So if I drop out to the four hour chart and we change our hist base to, let's say 117. If I set it to 1.17 and I set my style to style uh, columns and save the script, our hist base is now 1.17 and so any value that prints above 1.17 will be a column that prints in the upper half and any value that prints below 1.17 will be in the lower half. So that's the purpose of hist base. You might have seen this style of plotting in something like a MACD and it works on columns as we just saw, it works on areas as well. So there's an area with the hist base applied and it also works with histograms. So if I save the script, we get the same sort of effect. Now, let me change this back to a simple line and get rid of our track price and hist base. And we'll go over some of these other parameters that we have to work with. So the next parameter we have to work with is offset. Now offset does exactly what it sounds like. It offsets the plot. So if we want to um, shift this plot 10 bars to the right, you would set offset to 10. And now watch when I save the script, our line here will shift over 10 bars to the right here. So if you wanna to shift to the left, you would use negative 10. If you wanna to shift to the right, you use a positive number. So let's shift this line 10 bars to the right. Let me save this script. And now you can see that the plot is plotting with an offset of 10 bars. So the current value is being plotted 10 bars to the right. If we wanted to plot this line 10 bars back, you would just add a negative sign in front of that offset parameter. And now the line is drawing 10 bars back. Now there are a handful of reasons why you would want to use this offset parameter in your plots. We're not going to cover them all in today's lesson, but we will in future lessons when we get into more practical use cases of these parameters in actual indicator and strategy scripts. So now let's get rid of this offset for a moment and look at the last few remaining parameters. The next one is join, and the join parameter is a true or false variable, and it basically just adds a joining line between our plots. Now, when you're plotting a line like we are here, you don't need to use this parameter, it's useless. But if we were using something like, uh, let's try a style cross, save the script, zoom in a little bit. You can see these crosses have gaps in between them. We're plotting the closing price, so it's um, jumping up here as this big green bullish bar printed, the cross jumped up here. If we set join to true and save the script, now we have a line connecting all of our shapes. So any shape that has a gap between it, you can draw a line between them using the join parameter and setting it to true. The next parameter we can work with is editable. So by default, all of our plots are editable. But if you wanna stop the user from changing your plot for whatever reason, Personally, I've never used this parameter, but maybe there's a reason why you might want to prevent users from editing a certain plot in your script. You can set this to false. So by default, this is always true. But if we set it to false, watch what happens. Before I save the script, we'll open up the settings menu. And here's our plot here. If I save this script, wait for it to update, and then open the settings menu again, you'll notice that our plot uh, style settings are gone. We can no longer change the style of this purple plot. Again, I don't know why you would want to limit the customization of your script by your users, but the option is there if you need to. 
Now the next parameter we can work with is show underscore last. And show last basically just tells the script uh, how many plots to display on the chart. So if we set show underscore last to 10, for example, we will only show the last 10 plots onto our chart. So let's save the script. And now you can see we only have 10 plots drawing onto the chart. So you won't need to use this often. I never have, but it could be useful in certain scripts where you don't want to show historical analysis. You only want to show the most recent analysis onto your chart. For example, maybe you want to reduce clutter from your chart if you're drawing something like support and resistance levels. For example, maybe you don't want your chart covered in lines that were drawn hundreds of bars ago. You just want to show the last handful. And now the final parameter we have to work with when it comes to plotting data to our chart is the display parameter. The display parameter just basically turns on or off the drawing of your plot. So by default, it's obviously enabled, but if you want to, you can hard code your plot to set it to display.none, and then the plot will not draw onto your chart. This is great for debugging, so maybe you have some functionality in your script that you want to be able to check visually what it's doing from time to time, but you don't actually want that information drawing onto the chart all of the time. You can set display.none um, in your plot parameter, and then in order to actually see this drawn to the chart, you need to come up to the settings menu and turn it on here by clicking on this little checkbox. Now, when you set this to display.none, it does stop drawing the actual indicator value. As you can see here, we don't get our value plotting. So this essentially just turns the plot off completely. But let's say that you don't want the data actually plotting onto your chart, but you still wanna see the number. The best way to achieve this is using transparency. Now we'll cover the color functionality in PineScript in a future lesson. We won't go into detail in this lesson, but just really quickly to show you how it's possible to um, set a plot to be transparent, you can use the color.new function. So here I'm creating a new color. I'm using the color.new and then passing in the purple color. If I add a comma on the end here and type in 100, and then close off this parentheses we opened here. We're now creating a new color of the color purple with 100% transparency. And now if I save the script, you'll see our plots disappear, but the value is still plotting on the indicator status bar. So this is another great debugging tool or a way to plot something like the ATR. For example, maybe you want to plot the ATR in your script, but you don't want the ATR actually drawing over the top of price action. This is how you could go about doing that. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. I'll see you in the next one. Let's have a look at one of the most simple uh, technical analysis conditions we can check for in PineScript, which is moving average crosses. Now, this is not a trading lesson. I do not encourage you to trade moving average crossovers and cross unders. They may be profitable with the right rules, the right set of rules and entry reasons, etc. cetera. Um, I personally don't trade them, but for the purposes of this lesson, they are a great example of how easy it is to detect certain market conditions in PineScript. So to get started, we of course need two moving averages in order to detect a cross. So let's get uh, some MAs. And again, just today, because it's my favorite moving average, I'm going to use an EMA, an exponential moving average, but you can use any moving average type you like. I'm going to set EMA1 to TA.EMA, and we'll base it on the closing price as always, and this one will have a length of 50. And then the second EMA will have a length of 100. So now before we proceed, let's draw the MAs onto our chart, um, and I will style the first one with the color of color green, and the second one can be red. So let's save the code, make sure that this is working fine. There we go, two moving averages on our chart. Now um, let's detect our crosses, our crossovers and cross unders. So we'll create two variables here, two new variables called ma cross over and ma cross under. Now for our crossover and cross under, we're going to use the inbuilt function, ta dot, and then if I start writing cross, here we have our various options. Now cross will detect either a crossover or a cross under. For today, we're gonna to separate these two into their own variables. And so for crossover, I'm going to 
uh, use cross over, obviously. And for cross under, we'll use ta.cross under. And now these functions take two parameters, two values that need to cross. These could be any values. They don't need to be moving average values. They could be anything. Uh, MACD lines, for example, um, or the RSI crossing over a certain threshold. Um, for today, we're just going to put in EMA1 and EMA2. If I copy that into our second function here, we are now detecting our MA crosses. And at the bottom of our script, I'm going to draw crosses. And here I'm going to set BG color to MA cross over question mark. If the moving average has crossed over the other moving average, if EMA1 has crossed over EMA2, I'll set the background color to color.green. Otherwise, I'll do nothing with the background color. Set it to NA. I can copy this line of code, paste it underneath, uh, change this to cross under, and we'll change the color to red. And now, if I save my script, we'll be getting the background color of our chart changing based on which cross happened. So click save. And that will do it for this lesson. Very simple one here. Just, again, introducing you to the TA namespace and combining some of the things we've learned so far to create practical uh, indicators that can be actually useful in our trading. Anyway, I'll leave this one here and I'll speak with you in the next lesson. The source code will be below if you want to play around with this. Hello, my friend. Well done. You made it to the very end of this very long video. Congratulations. You are one of the few traders who actually commit to learning this stuff. Obviously, I have access to the metrics and analytics of my videos in both YouTube and on my course website. And you would be surprised how few traders actually commit and make it to the end. Most give up halfway through. So well done for making it this far. You should now be able to go out and start playing around with PineScript and start writing your own scripts. But if you do run into trouble or you want further guidance, make sure to check out my mastery course. I recently re-recorded all of the content for PineScript version 5. So this is the new and improved version. I've stepped up the content a lot and the new course has over 140 lessons and counting. I haven't even started recording the strategy section yet. I'm about to start doing that this week. So if you found this free basics course interesting, I think you will love the mastery course. We have a lot of great reviews here from traders who have gone through the course. Uh, you can come and read these here if you're not convinced that it's worth your time and money. There is a lot of content here from obviously the basics which we just covered to um, some of the more intermediate things like how to analyze price, how to detect candlestick patterns, how to use all of the various inbuilt functions and variables, as well as the inbuilt indicators. I've got a lot of material on indicators here. Then we go into information about accessing other timeframes and markets using the security function. Uh, we cover arrays. Uh, this is still in progress, this material here. Arrays are quite an advanced subject as far as PineScript is concerned. We cover libraries and soon I will be expanding into strategy scripts and even automation, how to automate your PineScripts through third-party APIs. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, head over to my website, pinescriptmastery.com. I have another course here as well where I share the source code to all of my published indicators and strategy scripts, including a bunch of private scripts that I've never actually released, and the source code to my really popular ultimate pullback indicator, which is the most advanced and sophisticated profitable trading script I've ever written. But anyway, I'll leave it here. Thanks for watching the video. Again, if you liked this content, make sure to hit the subscribe button because I will be back soon with more free PineScript material. If you're not yet ready to commit to learning more about PineScript and signing up to the mastery course, at least hit the subscribe button because I definitely will be back soon with more free content. With all of that said, well done getting to the end. Good luck with your trading. I hope you kill it out there in the markets. I hope PineScript helps you to enhance your edge and take your trading to that next level. And I'll leave you here. Have a great day or night, wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is. And I'll speak with you in the next video. Goodbye.